Bakshi. I think it's time that we talk about the elephant in the room. In fact, maybe I should have bought a herd. Let's just call the Greater Christchurch Spatial Plan what it really is, and that's 15 minute cities. Whose plan is this? How did it start? Sorry, why are you taking liberties? Spending our money on this before New Zealanders have the real facts. The average Kiwi is just trying to get on with their lives, earn a living to pay exorbitant taxes, and all while raising families, taking care of each other. So what time is left to trawl through hundreds of pages of your bureaucratic nonsense to try and decipher the hidden agendas? And this is only one. hundreds of pieces of legislation that has been rushed through all in the name of Agenda 2030. I know there have been meetings held of which I've attended, and I would hardly call them transparent and certainly not looking for real, honest feedback. Asking us questions and then giving us a list of pre-selected answers to prioritise is simply box-ticking exercises, trickery, the smoke and mirrors. Clearly directing people to the answers to match the outcome wanted by those paying. Based on the outcome of these focus group meetings and smart city expos, the panel may believe the majority of people support the spatial plan, but I can all but guarantee the majority of people don't even know about it. Now, why are councils wanting to carve a mass rapid transport route through the heart of our city, through Belfast to Hornby? out through probably to Rolleston, to Rangi or beyond, wherever. It will see the demolition of everything within its path. Picture a 200 metre wide strip of destruction right through the heart of Papua Nui, Miraval, Rickerton, your house, my house. Are the public fully informed that the transport route will be lined with high rise apartments to house the millions? Think of the crime that runs rampant in such living conditions. Crowded and close proximity living is a recipe of poor physical and mental health. Have you done a health and wellbeing plan for this proposal? Why the need to house a million people in the next 15 to 20 years? What do you know about population explosion? When in fact birth rates, fertility rates and the declining are declining and early unexplained death rates are rising. Or maybe we need somewhere for all the farmers and lifestylers to go when they're forced from their land through mass implementation of regulations that are based on non-science, such as the emissions trading scheme, carbon taxes, and the managed retreat plan. Why do we need to retreat? There's no settled evidence of sea levels rising, the water lapping around the Statue of Liberty, and the 1620 Plymouth Rock don't appear to have risen at all. Anyway, maybe the population increase you're so concerned about is in fact the out of control immigration. What are our councils doing to push back against this? Surely we should be taking care of Kiwis before we help others. It appears we cannot adequately house, feed, school and provide even some basic medical care. So why in the world have we flung open our doors like there is a never ending supply of these resources? These 15 minute city plans are like the proposed Selwyn speed management plan and road to zero. They will become more and more restricted until we are eventually living in five minute cities and road speed limits won't be an issue as private motor vehicles will be outlawed. And let's not even talk about air travel. That will just be a distant memory. But I'm sure we'll still see private jets flying over and smile. With proposed digital passports, and central bank digital currencies, we're heading to a very dark place as humans. And we have two choices, either continue down this track of enslaving us or stop and stand up and be honest and transparent and give the power back to the people. Let's have public referendums and expose the truth, such as the connections with sinister global parties. The financial waste that is in play here is quite frankly disgusting and nauseating. 
building stadiums for the few instead of housing and feeding the many. Multi-million dollar overruns on public swimming pools is an utter embarrassment to anyone making decisions around that. Who is accountable for this mess? What confidence can we have that the spatial plan would be delivered on time and on budget? Absolutely zero. And why in the world are overseas companies being engaged on anchor projects? Where is the loyalty and respect to our companies and our people? Local government funding agency. Four words that quite frankly terrify me. The LGFA was set up in 2011 under the Local Government Act for borrowing funds. The councils sign an indemnity agreement putting ratepayers at risk and potentially increasing rates until we cannot afford to pay them. Should this happen, our properties could be taken from us. We as the ratepayers and our properties are security for this debt. Just let that sink in. Will you be withdrawing from the LGFA? If not, why not? If you're not the people making the decisions about this, then I suggest you're the wrong people in this room. We need to directly talk with the decision makers and stop wasting our time and our money. Speaking of money, how much is the Christchurch Spatial Plan going to cost to construct? Who is paying for this? I don't want to contribute. I don't give my permission for you to spend one more cent of my money on this project. There's not unlimited money you can get from the ratepayers, but then again, you know this, and perhaps that's part of the plan. The greatest weapon is not a gun or a bomb, it's the control of information. To control the world's information is to manipulate all the minds that consume it. We know this only too well with a government-funded mainstream media, a propaganda machine. If I were you, I'd want to take some time to consider if I really wanted to continue down this path that makes you complicit in the destruction of your family's lives and the millions of people you are impacting. History has shown us the outcome of these types of plans. Lest you and we not forget what our ancestors fought and died for. Now let's say I'm wrong about all of this and it's just a conspiracy theory. Ask yourself one question, what if? I look forward to seeing the abolishment of this tyrannical proposal and may God defend New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, that statement you read out, is that available to us? Yes, yes. Uh, it might be easier just to pop it through um, in an email to the Secretariat. That's all good. I think everything's um, all being recorded and transparent. So, do the panel have any questions? No, thank you very much for your submission and your presentation, Donna and supporters. Thanks for coming in. Andrew here. Yes, hi, Andrew. Welcome. Was yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, my um, submission or my presentation is based on the submission for Hill Street Limited, um, which uh, the panel will have, will have already read. I apologise that I've only got my synopsis of this presentation through just recently, but hopefully you can have copies of that as well. Um, and I'll just try and talk to it fairly briefly. Um, sorry, I'm just uh, digesting some of the stuff that I've just heard as well. <laughs> Interesting, I, I didn't realise that the spatial plan was quite going to those lengths. Um, but the um, the point for HSL is actually uh, relatively simple, I think, um, in terms of looking at land that it owns, which is just to the west of Rolleston, um, and which it has purchased with the idea that Rolleston, when it grows, if it grows, I think is not really the question, um, is going to need some further greenfield 
land at some point in time. And I guess really the, the crux of what they're trying to say is that we don't see any reason not to be identifying that in some general sense um, at this stage in the process, um, as opposed to necessarily constraining what the spatial plan can include um, to things which are already in existing plans. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, um, but I'll just return to the actual written presentation. Um, so looking at paragraph from paragraph four, um, so HS, HSL's submission relates to all of the land within the uh, the blue boundary, boundary that's shown on that plan there. Uh, I don't know if you can show that on the. Sorry. We'll just bring that up, Andrew. And yes, just. Uh, no, it's the, the bigger one. So it's on the. I'll just stop. There it is. Let's zoom in there. Okay, so that blue boundary, this is your submission relates to that? The submission relates to, relates to all of that land, which has been, um, I think, identified in some also some private plan changes that have been uh, yes. looked at by Selwyn. Um, the actual land that HSL um, owns is in the, with the red boundary the red. at the bottom. Okay. So it's right on right. the corner. Yep. Um, and we say that, that the entire area um, is essentially ideal uh, for accommodating future greenfield development because it is adjacent to the existing urban areas and future urban areas, um, some still subject to private plan change process, uh, proceedings. Um, it can easily connect to existing plans, transport network, to the existing transport network. It would contribute to and foster a well-functioning uh, well urban environment, would provide a logical and defined and defensible urban edge for Rolleston. It's not subject to significant natural hazards, excepting that it is shown on the uh, flood management, plains flood management overlay, which of course relies to most, uh, applies to most of Rolleston. Uh, it's not subject to, to waitapu or significant natural values. It's not situated on highly productive land and would have minimal impact on existing permitted or consented primary production activities. I do note that the actual the original submission from HSL didn't actually specify any sort of relief, which I think is um, I didn't prepare that submission by the way, um, but I think that was a, a, a little bit of an oversight. Um, but essentially the, the document itself makes it clear that the inclusion of this land in some way, shape or form in the actual spatial plan is a good idea. And it's also, I guess, not limiting that there could be other pockets of such land elsewhere within the Greater Christchurch, which might uh, also fit within the criteria that we identify here. So the submitter's position is essentially that um, the section of the officer's report uh, and that talks about the scope of the Greater Christchurch spatial plan um, paints a picture of a somewhat hybrid document. I'm talking from Para 8 here. Uh, it's not an RMA document, but it's prepared under the Local Government Act, and so it needs to be had regard to, but not given effect to. And the need to have regard to the GCSP is reinforced by its role of fulfilling many, but not all, the functions of a future development strategy under the National Policy Statement for Urban Development. Now, that is an RMA document, but again, it's something that it has to be had regard to. It's not necessarily going to um, need to be given effect to as such. It's more for guidance. Andrew, just you're reading from the submission or something? No, I'm reading from the presentation. Oh, okay, which we haven't yeah. got yet. No. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, okay. I sent through an outline form, so sorry, you won't have it yet. Okay, okay, so. I do have hard copies of it. That, oh, that, would, that would assist. Just, yeah. well, why don't we just take a moment and spread those around? Sure. Thank you, sorry. Thank you. That should short circuit a bit of what I'm saying <laughs> and make it make more sense too. Paragraph eight, I think. Uh, we're down to paragraph uh, 10 now. 10 now. So while it's not binding, uh, it provides gu it provides guidance, and but it also appears to provide a more flexible view of potential future scenarios within the various opportunities and constraints that are covered in the officer's report and the GCSP itself. It does appear though that certain constraints that are imposed by other planning documents, which the GSSP is intended to guide but not bind, have been applied in a fairly restrictive way. In particular, the apparent adherence to MAP-A and the CRPS, the Canterbury um, Regional Policy Statements, uh, excuse the, uh, getting the acronym wrong, um, while incorporating some new development areas now confirmed under the district plan reviews. 
Now, while utilising and reflecting on the influence of MAPE in this way is understandable, it doesn't really seem either necessary or especially helpful in the broad context of a spatial plan. And I go on there to talk about the fact that the spatial plan is future looking. It's looking at the next 10 to 30 years, whereas um, MAP A and the uh, regional policy statement themselves are, are older documents, which are obviously up for review now. So from Paris 16, so whilst looking at over the next 30 years, it examines a mid-range population growth with the current 500 to 700,000 and then a 30-year 1 million scenarios. Yet apparently because of MAP-A constraints and despite the acknowledgement in the GCSP itself that some greenfield development may be required, both the 700,000 and 1 million scenarios are based on nil new residential identified uh, land beyond those areas already identified in existing plans. Now, without entering the capacity numbers uh, rabbit hole, because uh, I think it is one, um, this approach seems implausible, at least a little bit high risk. The notion that the urban population might double in size, but there'd be no f further increase in the urban area simply seems inherently risky as a basis for growth strategy. This is already shown by the inclusion of new development areas, and I've got there in figure two, the, uh, all the areas that were uh, promoted under the NPSUD around Wollaston. And of course, capacity is only one element, albeit an important one. Choice is also important, both in terms of geographic location, housing typology and price point. And pinning 100% of long-term growth strategy on the infill and build-out of already planned areas does not, in um, the submitter's view, uh, robustly respond to the need to also provide for choice. Andrew, can this, I just interrupt you there? So this, this plan you've presented here, Yes. can we just get a beat on this? This is Wollaston. It is. And this is all of the private plan changes that have been lodged that are referring to the NPSUD as justification. It's part of their justification, yes. Okay. So this is your plan that you just put together? No, it was from the actual um, Selwyn District plan, oh, the, the plan change. Uh, oh, sorry, so plan it's been modified. Process. Yes. Okay. Thanks. And I guess the short point for, for um, the submitter is that if it's accepted that additional greenfield land may be needed within the time horizon of the spatial plan, then what is the harm in signalling in our preferred locations where it should be? Remembering that such signals are only guidance, although in time they may be influential. From Parrot 20, I start talking about some criteria. Now, I know the, the officer's report identifies the four principles that it talks about in terms of uh, identifying future greenfields land. I'm going to interrupt again. <laughs> Okay, so I want to ask you a question about your understanding of um, at the last sentence in paragraph 19. Officers have told us that in legal planning terms, all future planning documents, the RPS, regional plans, district plans, will have to have regard to the spatial plan and, you know, not give effect to, but shall have regard to. Is that your understanding as well? Correct. And essentially what having regard to means is that they need to give it some consideration, uh, but the weight which it would give to the spatial plan in terms of any particular components of it would be up to the decision maker. Okay, thank you. So as I say, looking at those, those criteria that um, we have identified, which we think are sort of essentially planning 101 matters and, and are encapsulated in those principles that are already identified in the draft uh, GCSP. Um, we think that the identification of these criteria and the able to, the ability to actually identify land that fits within them um, actually is, gives a pretty good signal as to where future greenfield development would be appropriate. Um, and as I don't know if you want me to go through the list. Um, there's the, the list there that contains mostly what's in the principle. Take that as read, I think. Yep. Thank you. And I note that from the criteria we've put there, it's um, the idea that existing plan or, uh, an existing plan or strategy or featuring in an existing plan or strategy is not necessarily seen as a criteria, um, but we don't see that as being any, as creating any significant risk because of the art of... Um, out of sequence or out of left field proposals were to be made, then the criteria such as adjoining existing urban areas or contributing to a defensible urban boundary would be unlikely to be met in any event. 
In other words, these criteria are already in most cases subject to other policy statements, plans or strategies with which fulfilling the fulfilling, for, excuse me, would, fulfilling the criteria will indicate that at least general consistency with those. It's also tried to observe that any possible future greenfield development land identified in the GCSP will, must still pass through other planning processes that will include the review of the uh, regional policy statement and district plan changes, all of which will determine the weight or regard that must be had to any uh, had to for any particular piece of land informed and guided by the spatial plan, but not mandatory under it. So that's very answering the same point that made before. I note there also that the um, officer's report makes a point about the fact that the review of the regional policy statement is looking at including issues of significance uh, in relation to policy eight under the MPSUD. I would comment on that, that I, my understanding of a spatial planning process, though, is about actually looking at what is going to happen. And I think policy aid is really directed in, in large part about being responsive to changes that require planning responses. So uh, the idea that it's out of sequence or that it's unanticipated development, these are what those criteria or those uh, significance um, principles will be needed for. Um, I don't necessarily think that that means that you can't also step back and say, well, if it's going to happen, where's it going to happen? Which is really what the submitter is looking for. So identifying the submission land will also prevent an opportunity. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I'll go back to paragraph 24, because applying the above criteria to the submission land, uh, the submitter says that the area west of Rolleston is one of the few, if not the only, greenfield areas that ticks all of these boxes. A possible issue regarding the interface with the Pines Waste Water Plant and the Refuse Centre is acknowledged, but is also a matter of detail that is capable of mitigation as identified in current plan change processes. And I note the plan change 73 where the discussion was around buffers or even possible covenants, um, although I understand that wasn't favoured because the, the effect would still be there. But I do note that the uh, submission land also prevents the opportunity to deliver long-term planned growth at Rolleston, which has been earmarked as a satellite town since the 70s. It provides a logical, clear and defensible urban edge for Rolleston, identifies a sensible greenbelt approach, which would incorporate the existing sewer treatment plant infrastructure and enables a full utilisation of potentially missed opportunity that may result from the proposed um, large lot residential zoning uh, for parts of the submission land, which are identified under the plans that exist. So in conclusion, uh, the submitter generally supports the spatial plan, especially in respect of the identification of Rolleston as a pri priority development area and the, uh, the intention to foster growth, including residential growth around existing and locally important urban areas such as Rolleston. The submitter also supports the need to focus growth away from significant natural hazards and build resilience to climate change and to avoid development over Waitapu areas and areas with significant natural values and to protect highly productive land that is needed for food production. However, the spatial plan, while acknowledging that additional greenfield land or development may be required for the longer term and to provide for a population towards 1 million, fails to identify any future greenfield areas at Rolleston. The suggestion is that such matters be left to other statutory planning processes. That's the suggestion as, as identified. With respect, that seems to miss the point of spatial planning. If you know something may be required, it makes sense to identify where it might best be located if it is required. HSL say that there's no good reason not to identify such areas of potential future development. It is suggested criteria that lead to such areas becoming relatively simple to identify and which are consistent with the intent of the spatial plan. Therefore, the identification of the submission land on maps 2 and 14 makes logical sense from a spatial planning perspective. HSL would like that land included as a potential future development area priority area, which could also be um, pursued through other statutory planning processes with this guidance in mind. And I've attached two plans there, which are really just mock-ups from the plans in the, uh, the, the draft spatial plan itself, just showing uh, a blob next to Rolleston where we say that the submission land could fit in with the spatial plan's intent. You, you actually put the blob in pink. That's, yes. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Just one thing I did notice from the original and the addendum, you're short on transport. 
Uh, what views have you got on MRT? What's your clients' views on MRT? I think um, the the ability exists to incorporate the land, the west of Duns Road, and any future public transport options. And I think the park and ride options that are being talked about for Rolleston certainly don't delimit where the extent of the catchment for those park and ride options would be. Um, so I think that the the reality is with with public transport planning, the the options uh, would exist if if they were looked into. I we believe, and certainly that's something that future planning processes could actually delve into in greater detail, but certainly the, the ability to incorporate this area of land as developed land into any public hubs or, or future transport route options um, can't be discounted. There has to be an edge to public transport as well, and I guess it's, that's part of that identifying your clear edge. Thank you, Robbie, and thank you, Andrew, for your presentation. Right. Is Rebecca here? Rebecca Wayne? Come forward, Rebecca. Welcome to our hearing. And you have 10 minutes and the time is yours. Do you want to put on your um, speaker? Um, I'm very nervous. I haven't done this anything like this before, so excuse my nerves. Um, anyway, yes. Yeah, so basically, I um, suffer with anxiety issues. So me doing this pre presentation to you today has actually taken a lot for me. Um, but I really believe this is something that's really important for our district and the Greater Christchurch um, region. So. I feel quite passionate about it. Um, anyway, so basically um, what I'd like to do is just to read out a few excerpts from the um, draft plan and, um, and then just say a few points from that. Um, so in the introduction of the draft plan, it says the direction set out in the plan is supported by a commitment across central government local government and mana whenua to partner and invest in shared priorities for Greater Christchurch to ensure the city region remains a great place to live for all. I like that, all. The spatial plan seeks to deliver on the community aspirations for Greater Christchurch as a place where interrelationship between people and nature underpins a focus on intergenerational wellbeing and positions Greater Christchurch to be a place that supports the well-being of generations still to come. I also like that term well-being. Um, and in the overarching directions for opportunities uh, one to six, it also says uh, the desired pattern of growth in Greater Christchurch that best delivers on the six opportunities is to focus household and business growth through greater intensification in urban and town centres and along public transport corridors. Rides the best opportunity to achieve high density housing consistent with trends showing an increased demand for smaller homes. Provides the best accessibility and would support lower vehicle kilometres travelled and greenhouse gas emissions from transport. Um, so basically, um, it sounds like wanting uh, people to travel less distances to, lo to lower greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is restricting people's movement, freedom of movement. Um, and in page 30, it also states, uh, most people commuting to Christchurch um, uh, from Rolleston, for example, are doing it for employment. Um, so this will be cha changed this by building Rolleston, Rolleston's commercial centre. Um, and then the mass rapid transport uh, transit system on page 31. Wanting to achieve a net zero emissions future by providing alternatives to private car use, public transport, modern, uh, modern high quality vehicles running on a dedicated transport corridor that prioritise public transport as well as people on foot and bikes 
Connections between the districts and central city will be provided using a district bus service that uses a direct bus service, sorry, that uses the motorway corridors. Um, and then the next part was uh, the introduction of mass rapid transit, transit will require some changes to the neighbouring neighbourhood located along the preferred route. This includes prioritising walking and other modes of active transport, uh, dedicated lanes for active travel, e.g. walking, cycling, scootering. So on page 34, 33 and 34, there's the two diagrams, and um, it says you've got two different um, examples. So you've, uh, the narrower road corridor makes it challenging to provide dedicated space for all users. Mass rapid transport transit, e.g. buses, would take up a large share of the road, with limiting the remaining space for other modes of transport, e.g. cars. Low vehicle speeds with the city makes it, it safe for people on bikes to mix with slow-moving vehicles. Um, so, for example, there will be, um, it was depicted that uh, you have the same lane for bikes and cars in that picture. And in the second picture, you've got public transport access only with mass rapid transit lanes and the other lanes for walking and biking only. So that's no cars in that example at all. So, um, Which pages of the document are you on, Rebecca, with those? Oh, I've just noted down it was on pages. 40-41. Okay, thank you. Have oh, you got it? Oh. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, um, and then on page 45, um, it's also talked about in a global context, greenhouse gas emissions on a per capita basis are extremely high in Greater Christchurch, um, but there was no reference for this statement. Uh, more than half of its total emissions came from the transport sector, which there was also no reference provided for this for this statement. Um, and then on page 46, um, reduce transport emissions by supporting more people to live, work, shop, recreate and socialise within close proximity and to use public transport when they do need to travel. This is going to be a huge behaviour change that is going to be needed. Um, but restricting people's movement to confined areas because we need to reduce carbon emissions doesn't sound like a particularly great idea from my perspective. Um, a large portion of reasonings to make these huge changes to our region, uh, limiting people's freedom of movement by private vehicles and living in high density housing um, is because of carbon emissions. But according to the World Population Review, um, New Zealand emits to 0.09% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so with that in mind, is it necessary to place all these restrictions on people's lifestyles in New Zealand and indeed the Greater Christchurch districts? Thank you for taking the time to listen to my submission today. That's it. Very well, very clear. Um, we'll see if there's some questions. On the panel. Rebecca, where, where do you live yourself? Are you um, in Rolleston. You're in Rolleston? Yeah. Okay. So you've got a you've got a house here, you travel to Christchurch very often? Um a little, yeah, a little. I I do. But I mainly work in, in this area. You work in Yeah. I'm a SLD work. teacher, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well good. A PE teacher. Oh, and our ECLD teachers, so um, children that have specific learning disabilities. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Grant's got a question. That's a quick question. Your um, sub submission, um, you suggested you're a bit concerned about the identification of Rolleston as a key priority development area. Um, and you're concerned about the idea of high rise abutting single story housing. Mm. I suppose my question is, if there was appropriate um, separation by, say, open space or whatever, trees, green space, between those two sort of housing typologies, um, 
to deal with those issues that you mentioned about privacy and noise and some mm. like that stuff. Do you think that that would would be something that's worthwhile pursuing? Yeah, I think um, yeah, because like yeah, like I said in the submission, it, it, it is a concern. I think a lot of people would be concerned about you know these single story um, homes that um, you know you know you could potentially pop up um, an apartment block next door and then that would impinge on your privacy and that sort of thing but but yeah I guess if it if it was um those sort of buildings weren't sort of around those you know single story buildings and that that would be a probably a good solution yeah no other questions thank you very much for coming in Rebecca um really appreciate the time and the quality of your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you listening to me. <laughs> Is Don here? Welcome, Don. Come forward. Hi. Thank you for listening to me today. My name's Don Babe. I live just down the road a little bit from here. I must declare I am a cycling advocate, so I do usually wear a cycling helmet, but um, it's more general I'm talking about today. Um, just having a look through your report, uh, from the feedback, it seems like the special plan does meet the desires of most of the people that made submissions on it. I think this is a big tick for the process you've been through. It seems to have worked quite well. The key things from the engagement are all worthy and well reported, but I do think some of our health and well-being goals are being ignored. Um, this report, I don't even you see it on the screen, it's pretty little, but this is from um, Environmental Health Intelligence New Zealand, which I think is part of Massey University, um, and they looked at the um, premature deaths in the year 2016, so it's already seven years old, and there was 3,317, I don't know whether you can see that number there, of premature deaths. Okay, there we go. We can blow it up a little bit. That year, yeah. that were attributable to um, bad air. So that's a lot. That's about almost 10 times the road toll. That's um, It's pretty big. So um, and then it's got the reported social cost down there on the left, $15.6 billion just because of air. Now, the orange bit there is from PM2.5, PM which is mostly open fires but you can see a little bit of it's from motor vehicles. The blue bit is from nitrous oxide, which is just about all motor vehicles. So um, you can see what's happening to us. And 15.6 billion is around about 40% of our dairy exports for a year. So that means that two out of five of our dairy farms are busy producing all this stuff and the farmers are getting up early to do their milking just to pay the social cost of our bad air. So I think that any sort of planning device and planning process we're going through needs to consider these things because it's a huge cost, 15.6 billion, and so is 3,317 premature deaths. And this was 2016, it's probably got worse. Um, so your proposal to provide people with more transport options will go some way towards doing this, but I think it will struggle if densities cannot be increased. So I think you need to really work on densities. Low density requires extensive public transport networks to provide services within the recognised accepted walking distance of about 500 metres. So if you thought of Christchurch and Rolleston and thought, OK, you, no one's going to walk more than 500 metres, we've got to have buses or something available every 500 metres, you do need to have a, a big web. Um, and your proposal does encourage higher densities, particularly around transport routes. However, these are not being implemented with, with sprawl still evident in all three council areas, even close to transport infrastructure. Density has a bad name. People think of ghettos and slums instead of the better high density that can be seen in cities like Paris, London and most of New York. Paris has an average density of 20,000 residents per square kilometre. Now, if you want to click over to the next one. So this is our... Christchurch, and if you look really hard down the bottom, you'll see there's a little red label there that says this is what five kilometres from the central city looks like. So there's a ring around there which is five kilometres. Um, so if you've got 20,000 residents per square kilometre, 
If we applied the same to Greater Christchurch, the predicted population of 700,000 would only require 35 square kilometres. I don't know for certain, but I think that that infamous Stade de France is actually in that 20,000 residents per square kilometre. Um, looking at this map of Christchurch and the radius lines, and remembering your school-age maths, you can work out that 35 square kilometres are contained in a circle of approximately 3.3 kilometre radius. So it's not even out to that five kilometre line. It's somewhere in between the two and the five kilometre line. I'm really, oh, I can see the five kilometre lines at hashed line, I can see. Yes. Yeah, and then going in further, you can there see the go. two kilometre one. There's a two kilometre and a five kilometre. Yeah. Yep, yeah, got that. Thank you. This means that our city would stop at Summerfield, Sprayden, Addington, Rickerton, Fendleton, Maryvale, St Albans, Richmond, Linwood, Waltham and St Martins. So it would be quite small. Um, Selwyn and Waimakariri district councils would be dealing with rural issues like water quality. They wouldn't have anything to do with anything to do with um, urban stuff. Obviously, it's not possible to retrofit Paris into the bottom of the Port Hills, but we can make moves towards it. And I think stopping Greenfield's developments that are more than, say, 10 kilometres from the city centre would be a good start. People say that high density leads to slums and ghettos. But our low density has not avoided them, so don't get hung up on the fact that high density may produce more. It doesn't. Our current model of development is very beneficial to the developers, and that's why you've seen so many talking to you today. Rolleston and Rangiora are developing because the motorways have made city access much easier and quicker. The developers, developers are billed for some of these costs through development contributions, but the recovery is a small percentage of that cost. So the rest of us are subsidising them through our taxes and rates. I recall seeing a figure at least five years ago that every new house in New Zealand gets a share of existing infrastructure worth just under $100,000. But we only charge a small portion of that fee for development fees. So obviously development is a good thing for those guys, for those people. If we did have a city as dense as Paris, it would only be 6.6 .6 kilometres from one side to the other. We would not need as many roads, car parks, bus lanes or rail corridor considerations. A 6.6 .6 kilometre is walkable, but not very easily. But it is certainly bikeable in about 20 minutes. Hardly time to get a sweat up. In conclusion, I support the increased density along the transport routes, but this start needs to be extended over, the, over time so we're now Mokapuna are here, sitting here in 50 years discussing where to put one million people, they're not considering new motorways. Uh, and there was one little point noted in your um, summary of the submissions that I just wanted to clarify. You said that the people that opposed or had other ideas from the, uh, the rapid transport network from Belfast sort of to Hornby were mostly vested interests. I had a reposing view. I sort of wanted it to come in from Brighton because I think, again, if you had a good railway system that came in from Brighton, then it would automatically extend to Belfast and Hornby because you've already got the infrastructure there to a point. And those two areas are already well serviced by um, motorways. So I think you need to think about where you want to service because there's not much use just having motorways and railway lines servicing the same areas, I don't think. So it's just my opinion. So thank you. I'm just stay there for some questions. Um, thank you for the presentation. Your notes and these plans, can you get them through to the Secretariat or have they? Oh, yes, I can. Yes, if you yeah. could please email them and Jenny, if you could chase up these ones because we collecting up the presentations that you put more time into really is helpful for us. Okay. I'll see if there's any questions from the panel. Grant, you always keen. I, I, I was going to ask you a question about um, your concern that local councils not might not follow through with the plan. But listening to you, um, it seems that you're pretty positive about about where we all need to go, um, and and presumably uh, councils and, and and the people will be on board with uh, over time uh, ensuring that the spatial plan has gained some traction as it goes along. 
Is that is that your feeling? Well, I'm, I know a few councillors that are sitting around here today, and I respect the work they do, and they do a good job. So um, I'm sure they're pretty well tuned into logical thinking and understanding what the issues are. So yeah, I've got lots of faith in in local councils um, picking these things up. Just the next question you, you mentioned at the beginning about the well health and wellbeing issue, mm -hmm. and, and showed some slides about um, um, the air quality. And, and I know the government is looking at, at uh, currently looking at, at, at the review of that to get the 2.5 uh, incorporated in, into our national standard. Um, so that's certainly being worked on. Yes, but it needs to be worked on across the board. We can't just have little silos working on it. You know, this is this is important. 3,300 deaths and a lot, big proportion of them are in Christchurch. 420, I think, they reported in Christchurch, which is a lot of people. You know, our road top in Christchurch is what? I don't know. 35, 40, I don't know. And it wouldn't be anything like that. You know, this is 400 people a year. It's a lot of people. You probably all know someone. Don, where do you, where do you reside yourself? Uh, 10 kilometres down the road over here. Um, we've got a blueberry orchard. We grow blueberries, um, which we sell to the public. And um, I work from home as an accountant. Uh, okay. So that's what I do. Can you bike around the networks on the... Biking trails and things, or was it? That's why I didn't bike here today. I did too much yesterday and a bit worn out today, so I got a bit lazy and and yeah. made my few um, greenhouse gas emissions. But generally, I would bike here. Okay. Um, one of our panel members biked here, but not that far. But um, Victoria. Um, obviously, yes. Um, it just adds so much more. I talked about that 500 metres that people are prepared to walk to get to public transport, which is pretty well accepted. It's about two or three minute walk. Um, but if you've got bikes, you can extend that and become, say, a, a kilometre or a bit over a kilometre where people can get on their bike and get to the, the um, transport node and then go. But if you've got that at both ends, then you want to take your, your um, bicycle with you. And I actually tried to go to Picton a few years ago by rail. I thought, oh, this will be nice. We'll go up there and we'll do some biking and we'll come back some. I can't remember what it was about now. But they only took two bikes on the train and we were number three. So, you know, we were going to pay an arm and a leg to get to Picton by train, but we couldn't because they only took two bikes. It's just, you know, okay. how, much, how oh. small is a train that you can't fit one more bike on it? Very, very thoughtful submission. And... I do have one last question before you go. We are running a little bit behind time. Um, you made a comment about public transport out to the east. So when you talk about Brighton, you mean New Brighton? Um, yes, yeah. where the people are, really. Um, where the people are? Yeah, you've yeah. got to look at where the people are and say, well, we've got to service those people. Um, um, I don't, I haven't seen the sort of uh, densities out there, but... Um, you know, if you put a spine road through out to New Brighton, a uh, spine service out to New Brighton, I'm sure people would get to it. Yes, there's already so, big, wide spine roads out there, isn't there? Yeah, and I was over there yesterday, fast, fast cars all zooming up and down them and making lots of noise, and um, it was uh, a little bit hairy at times. But, yeah, they are big, wide roads, and they do encourage a lot of bad behaviour. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Don. Thank you. Is Lawrence here? Is that? Been David about. Oh, okay. I can see they've been crossed out. Right, we can um, move to Ian now. Ian, are you? Are you in? Oh, here he is. Thank you, Ian. You've got a presentation, I think. Thank you for allowing me time to make this presentation. Um, so you'll see the title of my talk. Excuse me. How, oh, how do I get this to? Where do we start? Is that? Can you restart the time, time please? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the chance to talk to you today. Ah, that's not working either. <laughs> Yep. 
Okay. We, we do have some extra time at yeah, the end thank, if you, if you thank need you. it. Thank you. So just carry on. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, the purpose of the Greater Christchurch Spatial Plan is to set a desired urban form for a projected population of 700,000 and beyond that to, to 1 million people to ensure Greater Christchurch is future proof in the context of population growth and climate change. I'm here to give you some information to suggest that that foundational belief in climate change is unfounded. From 1800 until 2015, man has increased carbon emissions from about 30 million tonnes to 36.2 billion by burning fossil fuel. There's 1800 on the graph and there's 2015. That's a 120,000% increase in carbon emissions. In 1750 to 1850 is seen as the start of the Industrial Revolution. See there marked. This is regarded as the beginning of the current climate crisis. The graph appears to give reason for alarm, but what does some basic evidence say? This is sea level rise uh, from 1807 in a place called Brest in France. This is supplied by NOAA, an official US government department. And you'll see that's a linear increase in sea level of 1.04 millimetres per year. That's from 1810 in Poland. That's a linear increase. That's the battery in New York. Same linear trend since 1855. Fort Denison in Sydney shows the same linear increase since 1885, and Auckland shows the same linear trend since 1905. So if we impose, transpose one over the other, what is the relationship between sea level rise and carbon emissions? There's a start at Brest, and there it is currently. There is no relationship between 120,000% exponential increase in CO2 output and your linear constant increase in sea level. So where's the evidence for increasing glacial melt? The world stopped using any fossil fuel. What would happen to sea level rise? The answer is nothing. Because the cause of sea level rise has nothing to do with man burning fossil fuel. Well, what's the relationship between eyewitness accounts of glacial decline and carbon emissions? Well, there's our sea level rise again at Brest. Well, this is Glacier Bay in 1750 in Alaska, eyewitness accounts. A guy called Vancouver had something to do with the recording of this data that I'm going to present. So you'll see there that Glacier is extended out into Icy Strait, some of it 1,200 metres high. Those eyewitness accounts. And by 1800, 1880, most of it had gone. Most of the ice that has gone today had gone by 1880. And in fact, in the first 40 years, a dramatic reduction in sea ice, in, in ice, glacial ice, was observed in Glacier Bay. This is Fox Glacier, that's Cone Rock, photos taken there in the late 1800s, taken at that point, and then 48 years later, the ice had retreated dramatically upstream of Cone Rock, so we've got eyewitness accounts there. And this is the Thames in London, uh, from about 1650, 1670, somewhere there, up until 1814 to 1815, they used to have ice fairs on the frozen Thames, but it's recorded 1814, 1815 was the last one because they reported themselves that the weather was warming. So that was the last time they had an ice fair after, after about 150 years. So how come man is blaming fossil fuels for the melting of sea ice and sea level rise when we know from eyewitness accounts from before the Industrial Revolution that the ice was already melting and has and it has done so at a constant rate since at least 1807. Average temperature is gradually increasing, but what you're not told is that it's not the maximums, but it's rather the warming minimums. And anybody that's grown up in Canterbury will know that to be true. And this is uh, from, from uh, Fresno in California. Since 1895, you'll see that the maximums haven't gone up, but the minimums have, just like they have in Canterbury, with an average right through the middle of 1.05 degrees centigrade per century. This is data from NIWA, Seven Station Temperature Series, December 2010. You'll see that we have also an average increase. Fresno's was 1.05 and New Zealand's is 0.91. But what they need to be telling us is that it's not the maximums, but rather it's the minimums going up. And we know from since 1750 at Glacier Bay that the ice was melting back then, and that's driven by minimums, not maximum temperature. 
Well, what's happening to wind strength in Canterbury? This is from the Selwyn District Council's own report. It says there, there's a long-term trend towards higher values indicating that climate change is leading to a less frequent and weaker westerly winds over the South Island it's from about 1955. But what about rainfall? This is taken from the Selwyn District Council also. And in bold there, it says the analysis of the mean of these time series shows no long-term trend, no statistically significant correlation to the signals and no statistically significant differences between annual frequencies for the differences in the phases. So you'll see there, rainfall and its extremes has shown no looming crisis over 110 years of data. So with over 100 years of temperature data at Fresno, we can see what would happen to our economy if we reduced carbon emissions by 84% to 1950 levels. Well, that's the start of Fresno's data. There's the end of it, and there's 1950. So if we reduced our carbon emissions back to 1950 levels, what would happen to the economy? Well, you destroy Fresno's, and it's going to destroy ours, and we will have achieved nothing. So what about rainfall data? Well, there's the start. There's the end of the information presented to Southern District Council. There's 1950, so if we reduce our carbon back to 1950 levels, it's going to make no change in the rainfall whatsoever and the extremes. And that's from the Selwyn District Council's own data, but will destroy the economy. This is the CTV building. Christchurch City Council gave permission for that to be built in 1986. And a bloke called Stefano Papanen, an associate professor at the University of Canterbury who teaches structural engineering, described the non-ductile philosophy as an obsolete design based on the levels of knowledge and the code provisions that existed before the mid-1980s. In other words, the building was built with, with outdated technology. They didn't have the truth. The structural engineer, his name's there in writing forever for everyone to see until it's removed. And I dare say, um, unfortunately, the responsibility of, of Christchurch City Council could also be in writing forever too, if we get this wrong. And on both occasions, the building was declared safe by engineers and it killed over 100 people, as we all know. So not only did the Christchurch City Council give the okay for it to be built, but engineers did too, and 100, over 100 people died. So here's a question for you. What does it mean for you and, your, and our children if, like the CTV building, the dominant narrative on climate change is wrong and we spend over $4 billion for nothing? So what do you do about it? Well, unlike the CTV building, consider all the evidence in your decisions, including from people like me. I will need 60 minutes of your time to show that man has little or no impact on climate. One of the main reasons given for the Greater Christchurch Spatial Plan and President Obama's Chief Science Advisor agrees with that. There are other resources that I've listed there for you to look at. I've got many, many more. Thank you. And there's my email address if you want to make contact with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. That's a lot of information very quickly. Your This presentation we have, Jenny, and we'll be able to click through and look at the various references ourselves. So thank you for supplying that, Ian. I'll see if there's any questions from the panel. Doesn't seem to be. I'll certainly be looking through this carefully and, um, you know, can be assured that we will do take all, all the information presented to us and we've read all the submissions. We'll go through and um, have a look at this. So thank you very much for your attendance. Can I just say, I, I do give public talks on this. I've given many. Yes. They've all been very well received in front of professional engineers, etc. and nobody has contested anything that I've said. And and I'd love the opportunity to, to put the information to the council. Yeah, what, what's your qualifications? You've got a bat Bachelor of Applied Science in Rural Technology with honours from an Australian university. Yes. And I've worked in applied research for 40 years. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right, so I think 
and that's the end of our submitters for today. Um, we'll just finish with our uh, a short cut up here. Um, I just wanted to raise a matter for the officers to have a look at. Did you want me to do that now or did you want it post? Um, you go ahead, Victoria. Oh, thank, thanks, uh, Mr Chair. I was just conscious that a, a couple of our submitters today referenced um, the future and further utilisation of the existing heavy rail corridors that we've got. And I'd be interested to know then um, what other work streams are happening in this space, because I'm aware that conversations have been had at the Canterbury Mayoral Forum and, and perhaps the Regional Transport Committee are also looking at this. So I'm just a bit concerned that I'm sort of hearing this stuff in isolation and uh, in a silo. So I'd, I would like to understand what other conversations is, are being had in relation to the heavy rail corridor um, that could perhaps help to inform us as we're considering this piece of work. Specifically, Victoria, around what's in the public domain from those other committees yeah. looking at the heavy rail corridors? Yes, specific? please. Yep. Okay. I'm so just concerned about sort of duplication and, and, and silos. Not making sure that we're, we're up to speed with where the other public committees and forums are at. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I do have a, two other questions that have arisen for me um, that I would like to put get some feedback from the council officer team on. The first one is about the priority area in the east. I I don't understand. Is doesn't seem to be a definition of the priority area and how that relates to priority growth areas. And I, differences and where it sits and what's planned and what's different to the priority growth areas. It's not clear on the face of the documents. There may well be in past discussion papers and things, but I would really want a, a very clear explanation from the staff about what is the definition of the priority um, construct. I think at least it does need to be defined and we are very clear going forward what that term actually means for the East. So that's the first general inquiry. The second inquiry is up until this morning when I asked Kate about New Zealand Rail, I'd assumed that New Zealand Rail was came under the public, sorry, the, the partnership from the government sitting at the table. So I've just had clarified that no, New Zealand Rail is not part of the government's partnership involvement in the Greater Christchurch Partnership, but it is a government agency of some description. They're set up differently, I know. So my questions really are around what involvement has New Zealand Rail had in the preparation of the spatial plan? Have they made any representations to the committee? And do they have a position on the spatial plan, including any correspondence or submissions made through the various processes? We can just clarify that question, but it's pretty important given that we've had lots of submissions regarding the potential long or medium long-term use of the rail corridor um, seems to be a pretty critical part of our decision-making process. So, Victoria? The, um, a, another issue that's um, left a bit hanging for me today was um, the matter that uh, Mr Carter touched on in relation to the area in Kaiapoi 
which, as I understand it, has been marked as an area that um, can continue to develop on when he references that it's got every natural hazard known to man over that particular area. So I'd like to be able to understand uh, what the officer's thoughts are and comments are in relation to that, particularly if it's been recognised previously, as it should be an area that shouldn't be, uh, as it is an area that shouldn't be developed on. Yeah, that's, that's a good question as well. So, Kathy, that's a lot to put, <laughs> put down as we're, we're um, talking about it. But I was I've tried to be sort of slow and precise about those specific queries so we've got all the best information back from the officers. Kate. Yes, on that note, um, one of the questions that popped into my mind through the Property Council submission was um, the, airport, the airport and the university were mentioned. And it would be really good to have some information about what are the implications of the PT Futures program for connections to the airport and the university. Because there was a sort of general. Yes, um, I think we already got a, a question about the MTR and it's for origins and why it's not heading west and east. Um, but we'll, I certainly, um, that's the first evidence we've had about the airport and the university connectivity in terms of a gen. Well, quite a bit of work, I think. Um, what, what we've decided to do is to together our set of questions for the first three days of the hearing this afternoon, clarify those, make them as clear as possible. So we'll issue those to the staff and then we'll do the same. We'll collect them up as we go, but the next three days of hearings, we'll issue another set of, of clarification questions for the officers. Questions? I think that's pretty well covered. So a, a good morning of hearing. Thank you for everyone attending. Um, we will finish with our karakia. Someone needs to start us off. <laughs> oh, kia faka ara te tapu, kia watia ae te ara, kia turiki fakta. Ta I kia turiki pata I ha I me he uki taiki. Thank you. So that adjourned, we'll adjourn the hearing until Thursday morning, and we're at Christchurch City again. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>